we can apply into our lives so that we can give glory and honor to your name in the way that we live. So we do thank you and praise you now and we offer this prayer in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so just as an introduction to um, Cliff's talk tonight, he's asked that we read from the Gospel of Matthew, um, from Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 19 to the end. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So with that as an introduction, I'll call forward Cliff. Thank you. Thanks, Pete, and <clears throat> good evening to you all here, and um, thanks for inviting me to uh, come and speak to you. And I did ask Andrew about the subject, and when I was <laughs> given the subject, I said, um, how do you choose the speakers? And he said, oh, we choose the speakers as you know, experts on the subjects. And, you know, and I, I thought to myself, it's funny, because you know, Andrew's like, very good on the proverbs, so he'd do talks on the proverbs, and I think Steve can do the Song of Solomon, and then I've been given the love of money as my, <laughs> as my subject. A guest speaker coming in and speaking on the love of money. So, but I, I do relate to the unhappiness part of this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this um, subject, but it's because of the lack of money, not the love of money. So I've got my own, my own version of this. But um, I make light of it, but um, it is a subject which does actually take up quite a lot of um, scripture. So there's a lot of a lot about this and it really becomes an important thing to talk about that we probably don't talk about enough and I think all of us know that we're very um, 
uh, well off in this country and we're very uh, blessed with everything we have and, and those who have travelled um, to third world countries and done work there know that there is a, a vast difference between what we have and what what they are um, you know, sustained with. So it's a very important subject and it's one that we do have to, I think, bring to our attention uh, more often than we do because we do get caught up in in this, this life and everything that happens uh, with it. But the subject comes from First Timothy 6, the actual uh, quote there. And I'm short-sighted, so I can't see your faces, the expression on your face. If you can go to, you can go to sleep and I wouldn't even know. Um, especially the people on Zoom. Are they on Zoom? Is it, or is it Zoom here? Yeah, Zoom. So they might be asleep anyway. But anyway, here's the quote. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So... Here we have this quote um, from Paul to Timothy and he compares loving money and pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness and gentleness. So we do have to view our uh, walk in the truth as something that is opposite to the love of money. We've got to really understand that and see that. And it would appear that Um, from everything we're going to see tonight, that they're not compatible. You can't love money and also uh, pursue the truth in your life. And Paul says, fight that good fight of faith. So there's a fight there. And when we talk about the fight, we're always talking about our own personal um, weaknesses, aren't we? Our personal weaknesses that um, trouble us and cause us to go astray. So there's a fight there, and it's probably good, fair to say that um, we've got to keep at that fight all the time. You can't say, oh, I've, there, I don't think there'd be anyone here that, that says, oh, you know, this is, this is not a problem um, to me um, uh, with, with the, the way we view uh, money and wealth. So the thing to really point out at the start is because I think the quote sometimes gets said as um, uh, that money is the root of all evil. It's not money, it's the love of money. So money itself is not evil, it's a way in which we trade, so we use it as our way of um, uh, buying goods in all countries. But it's our attitude to money that's either going to condemn us or save us. It's what's in here, how you, how you view money, how you consider money, what, what position it plays in your, in your life, what priority it has in your life. Now the truth is, when we don't have enough of it, we think we need more. That's a, that's a natural thing. And when we do have plenty, we want more. So it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it doesn't ever stop. Um, and even tonight, uh, Andrew was... We had dinner here at the hall, by the way, so I don't know if anyone knew there was a dinner at the hall, but we shared a dinner together. And, um, and he paid, so that's very nice of you, Andrew. Do I owe you money? That's the idea. But he said to me, he said, Cliff, it's funny... Um, you got drive through Baldwin. He was in Baldwin, and he said, and he looks at all the the houses and the cars and the people driving around, and, and he said, you know, they're, they're in Baldwin, but ultimately they wish they were in Turak. You know, that's what he said. So, or they want to be somewhere else, and it's true. I think that's what happens with ourselves. We we think, oh, we'd rather be somewhere else because that would be better. Um, but what happens is we get in this trap of always feeling um, that we need to be chasing something that's slightly beyond us. And we, um, we like to think that we're going to be in a better place than what we would, would have been if we um, get into an, a new location, a new car and, and all these things. Now, I can actually say this, that at one stage I owned a Mercedes-Benz. And I'm not picking on anyone that owns a Mercedes-Benz here, so don't, don't think this is a comment about Mercedes. But I had a Mercedes-Benz. It was a beautiful car. I loved this car. It was a sensational car to drive comfortable and um, it was expensive to maintain. I couldn't, I couldn't keep it because it was too expensive to maintain. But I remember driving that car and thinking that I had some status with driving the Mercedes, you know. And what happens is you sit up a bit straighter, 
you know, you, you do look at other people in their cars and, oh, you haven't got a Mercedes, you know, but I've got one. Now, I'm being silly, but I did enjoy it and I, I got probably caught up in that little stage where I thought, oh, that's a, a, such a great car, it was quiet and all that. But your mind gets, unfortunately, affected by it and you do think, oh, I've got a, a nice position in this world with having that, I've got a nice status with that car. So just, just to give you an example. So how do you view the subject, right? Now, this is, some of you might have already, you know, looked at this and thought, oh, it's not a problem to me. I'll let Cliff talk to me tonight, but it's not a problem to me. It's not relevant to me. Or is, it might be a problem from time to time. And do you believe the love of money is unique to the rich? I don't think so. I think it's all classes in society, in, in our society, would um, look at money as being um, a thing to have. And it's a, it's a topic which is right through the Bible, right through the Bible, this topic of the love of money. So it's a real issue that God knows um, pops up in our lives. So it's a real, a real concern. Now, I thought I'd put to you, and I've written this up there. I know you're thinking, boy, Cliff writes everything up on his PowerPoint. But I wanted to give you this thing tonight, this idea tonight. If you had a choice to be here and hear this talk from me, or... Tonight there was another talk where the presenter was going to give everyone in the audience $5,000 just because they were going to sit there through his talk. Which one would you go to? So you've got me tonight, right, up here and reciting some quotes from the Bible, or you get $5,000 for being a talk. We'll even call it down the road. So you're down the road in another hall and there's going to be $5,000 giving to you just for turning up. Now, put your hands up if you think you'd be at the other talk. I'd be there too. Yeah. Now, it's funny, isn't it? What I say that and, and we all think, yeah, I'd go to a talk for five grand. I'm going to pick up five grand. So the answer is most likely the same for all of us. Now, I think some of you would say, this talk's getting recorded anyway, so I'll hear it later. Yeah, That's the option. I'll hear his talk later. I get the five grand. Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner. We all come out happy. Maybe not me, not having an empty audience, but... Um, but that's the way. Now, if I said five hundred dollars, would you still be at the other talk? There's people going, yeah, <laughs> too right. I would. I'm not going to go down because I think I would get a little bit of self-esteem problem um, if I was to keep going down. So we'll leave the leave that money bit out of it. But that just gives you an idea of what we're like, isn't it? We are like that. If the, if we know there's an opportunity to um, to get money um, and it's free and it's easy, hey, we, we'd like to do it. So what we want to now do is look at the examples in the Bible that are given to us about this problem. And I've got quite a number to go through. And um, that time's wrong, isn't it? So I've got, and I can't see that clock, so it's a problem. All right, so the first one is the sin of Achan. So we go back right back into Scripture, right back into the early part of Scripture to see this problem. So it, and, and it goes right through Scripture. Now, it's the story of the taking of Jericho, and we know the, um, the story well about um, uh, what happened in Jericho. And God had said, you can go into Jericho, but all the spoils that come out of Jericho have to come back. Uh, Joshua said, they've got to come back to the treasury. They're all going to be used um, for, uh, for later on in the temple. So we need to collect all the spoils. They're all going to come in, and they're all going to be given to the treasury of God. And this, this is what happened. Now, Achan, um, in his little little mind there, thought, I can take some spoils and it won't affect what's happening. I won't, it won't affect all the, the things that will go back into the treasury. I can take some spoils and keep them for myself. And what he kept was, you'll remember, this is something that all of us who've been through Sunday school remember, there was a beautiful uh, robe, a Babylonian robe, uh, there was 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. And he kept all those, those things from the, um, when they took Jericho. And what happened was they then went to the next city, and the next city was going to be Ai. And you remember that the first contingent of soldiers that went in uh, were killed. And everyone was like, what? what's going on here? We've got gods behind us. We've got God's blessing. What happened? And God revealed that, um, a sin had been committed back in Jericho. And Achan had hidden all these goods in the ground under his tent. Now, we, just with that alone, we know that his reasoning in his mind wasn't that good if he's hiding it in the ground 
under his tent. And there's obviously guilt and there's, um, in his own mind, he, he's realised he's done the wrong thing. Now, all of this was retrieved and um, the family um, was taken to a valley with all the possessions, all their livestock, the tent as well, and they were all stoned and they were all burnt as a result of this um, sin. <clears throat> now, the sin of Achan was that he disobeyed, so he didn't listen to what uh, 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 Joshua had said to bring all the spoils to the treasury, and that's because he lusted after those spoils himself. He wanted them for his own gain. He didn't want to give them to God, which is what was supposed to happen, and he believed he could hide these things and get away with it. Now, he was oblivious to the fact that God sees everything. And what you've got to take out of this particular story is that God looks into your heart and your mind and he knows everything you're thinking, everything that you're holding back, everything that you're focusing on. He sees it all. He sees our motives, he sees our actions, he sees our heart. He's always looking at you more than we look at ourselves. And that's, that's the thing we've got to realise. Now, <clears throat> what I want you to think about is this. The particular thing that happened with Israel was an internal problem. So they're going now to fight the enemy that God had said, okay, um, the Canaanites are the enemy. You're going to go and fight them. But the actual enemy wasn't outside. The enemy was inside. And this is what we've got to really understand from this particular um, story is that you can't blame everywhere else and everything else in this, in this world. It's in here that we've got to focus on and say, this is where the problem is. We think we're going to hide things from God. We think we're going to do things and we're going to get away with it. And it doesn't really work that way. Our enemy is our own flesh. It's our own weaknesses. It's our own desires. So remember that from this story. It's a story about the sin being within Israel and their enemy not being without. Now, obviously, they were dealing with an enemy without. But God was showing them that there was a problem in here, inside. Okay, the next story is the story of Gehazi. So you remember uh, Gehazi was a servant to Elisha, the prophet. And um, this particular story is in 2 Kings. I'm not doing um, the story itself. But we t we, when we read this story, we read of the sin he committed, a lie he then subsequently said, and the punishment that he received. Now, it was all to do with um, Naaman the Syrian. So Naaman, um, who was a, a, um, a, a warrior, had leprosy and he was healed by Elisha. You remember, that's a, a quite a detailed story. It's one of our uh, Sunday school stories. And you remember he had to uh, dip himself in the Jordan, which um, initially he resisted. Now, he was then healed by washing in the dirty Jordan and Naaman wanted to reward Elisha with goods but Elisha refused. Elisha was, no, no, no. Um, the transaction for Elisha was already complete because what Elisha um, saw as the reward was that the power of God had been demonstrated to um, Naaman. So that was the important thing to Elisha was God's healing power had been shown to this Syrian. And Naaman had acknowledged God. So there was a beautiful transaction which was completed here already and that's all Elisha wanted and there can be no monetary exchange for that sort of work that that um, was done by God so in Elisha's mind it's God who must get the glory and it can't there can't be any material riches that would be paid um, to his servants no matter what justification process um, one could come up with now Gehazi didn't get any of this he's He's thinking a completely different way to Elisha and he sees Elisha reject the, um, uh, the goods, the gifts, and he must have been going into some sort of crazy, you know, uh, uh, sweat and thinking, oh man, we're about to lose out here. You know, we nearly hit the jackpot and now this guy's going. So he saw a lost chance at material gain and what he did was, at the right time, he went after Naaman. So he chased down Naaman and he then went to him, he lied to him, um, gave a story and he took possession of the gifts. He then returned home and he hid the gifts in his home. 
So he, it, it's the same thing, isn't it? He goes and he, he thinks I can get away with this. I'll just put the gifts in my, my own personal space and no one will ever know about it. He then goes to Elisha and you know Elisha said, you know, where have you been, Gehazi? And Elisha knew very well where he'd been. And then uh, Gehazi um, lied to him. And then he was punished with a disease, which was the leprosy. So the very disease that, um, uh, that Naaman had, had all of a sudden been transposed to Gehazi because of his greed. Now, Gehazi interpreted this whole thing as an opportunity to make money. He was wanting to make money and profit. He then brought deceit and disrepute into the equation as well because Elisha wanted God to get the glory and Gehazi was wanting to seek some of his own personal um, gain. Now, in Gehazi's mind, no harm was done. Gifts were available. They were going to be exchanged. Um, Elijah didn't want them, but he would appreciate them without any problem. So he must have had a justification process in his brain that said, you know, this is all right because they're here anyway. The gifts are here and I can justify um, uh, keeping them based on what's happened and, and how Naaman's been um, restored to good health. But in Gehazi's mind, God's glory had zero significance zero significance it was his own personal gain he was now focusing on he's focusing on himself so the story is telling us that the love of money is that something it, it's something that eats away at our life and our mind and it corrupts our thoughts because he was punished with leprosy so it was going to now eat away at his body it's a disease which slowly um, takes away the um, the extremes of the body at first and works its way up until eventually the person dies. It's, it was incurable. So this punishment that he received was to remind him of what the love of money does. It eats away at someone's mind, it eats away at their thoughts, and it changes their, their very actions of what they do. So that's a lesson to take from um, Gehazi. Now Solomon also talks about um, the love of money. Now Solomon, of course, we know was blessed with uh, riches from God because of the, um, the, the wisdom that he um, had. And uh, he says in Proverbs 23, Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? So he, he brings it to a visionary thing that um, wealth and riches are something that our eyes are actually wanting because we, we transfer all of that into goods. We transfer money in our mind, we translate it, I guess, into, into goods. So he says, will you set your eye on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. So he's saying that they flitter away. All these things flitter away and we don't realise it. So Solomon tries to bring perspective to gaining wealth. Uh, work to provide, but don't try and accrue more and more. Everything you gain will flitter away in one way or another. It's not a permanent thing that we have for us forever. And he mentions our eyes because he wants us to know we love to see more and more in our possession. It's a, it's a visual thing. And when we, and I'll go back to the Mercedes. Um, I'm not obsessed with Mercedes anymore. So that's a, it's a historical bit of information. Um, I do think they're a, a nice car. But it's, it's something that you could look at. So you wash the car and it gleams and you, and you stand back and you think, oh yeah, I've given that a good polish, that, that car looks really good. So this is, it's a visual thing. Does everyone appreciate what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't think, and, and it might be visual by looking at the bank account and going, oh, that's my balance, you know. That might be the visual thing. But whatever it is, it's, it's something that can possess our minds and possess our attention. Ecclesiastes 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. This is verse 10 to 12. Nor he who loves wealth with his income, this also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Getting fat. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleeper of a labourer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So as he came from his mother's womb, so shall he go again. Naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. That's verse 15, which is a few verses after that. So Solomon highlights that wealth is an excess that can give one an excessive life. They have 
excesses in their life that they don't need. And he talks about it in the terms of food and having a full belly. Um, so you can uh, turn your wealth into something that gives you this great opportunity to eat more and, and, and have more and be able to do more. So he contrasts this with the labourer who sleeps easier without all these excesses of life. That guy's got less to worry about. So he talks about wealth and riches being a visual thing, things that we can see, and it's those things that make the rich happy. And all their possessions make them feel like they've achieved something and they have some status. And I think we can all relate to this. Now, reality is, from this, these quotes, is that we came in the world with nothing and we leave with nothing. We've got to realise that. We don't take all these things... You know, they don't have a coffin that's built the size of our house, you know, and the house goes in there and the car and, you know, our bank account and all this sort of thing. That doesn't go in there. It's only our body that goes uh, in the coffin when we go. So... Um, all those possessions should mean very little to us. Now, the parable of the sower. So this is an interesting one because I feel that this is really important to take in because it talks about people who are in the meeting, in the, in the ecclesia, um, in this particular instance. So Jesus tells the parable. It's in three of the gospel records. And we know that there was four groups um, who received the seed and um, they all reacted differently and three of the groups are seen as failures there's only one group um, that has the harvest and the good result now one of the descriptions of the seeds and its result is as follows this is from Matthew 13:22, and we could have chosen any of the three gospels but it says now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful so there's a group they've heard the word but all of a sudden the actual world and its riches have overtaken that person and he ends up becoming unfruitful he's not part of the the fourth group he's part of this third group and i have a feeling that this is us from time to time that we do get caught up in the world and we get caught up with our riches and those things overtake the opportunity for us to be fruitful because we're busy um, concerning ourselves with our wealth. That's a real, that's a real situation there, the um, parable of the sower. And we have to interpret this in a way where we don't call ourselves just the fourth group and we're fine. We can't do that. We have to see that there's a real threat to us being in the kingdom if we are uh, putting ourselves into the world and what it's pursuing. We have to be very careful. And I think that lesson has to really come home to us. We can't just ignore this. And we need to see that it's a danger. It is an actual... The world is a danger, what it presents to us. You know, we all talk about social media and um, how clever it is, and it is very clever. Social media is... Right now is the most clever thing that's going on in the world as far as marketing is concerned and getting people's attention and getting people's dollar. And I think, you know, all of us here, um, so does anyone here use Facebook? And there's ads on Facebook and um, so you're reading one thing and then you've got this ad about something and you go, how does this ad popping up on my Facebook? And that ad's because you did a search on something a while ago and it's trying to tell you if you don't have these, you know, Nikes, then you're not a person, you know, you're, not, you're no good. If you don't have this... Um, now, I got sucked in, I'm going to be honest. They were R.M. Williams, really cheap. <laughs> and one night, I was in bed and I was, doing, I was doing the Facebook before I was going to sleep. And the R.M. Williams came up and it said $40 for R.M. Williams. And does everyone know R.M. Williams are like in the hundreds of dollars? I got taken for... And it, it, there was a time limit there of when you could get these. And I thought, oh man, I'm about to go to bed. I'm about to go to sleep. I need to do this now. So I'm getting the, I go out and get the wallet and I get my card and I'm punching everything in there and choosing the colour of the shoes. I'm so excited. Chose the colour, chose the size and, and I couldn't even tell anyone because it was late at night. I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting Ari Williams for 40 bucks. I can't believe this. This is so good. Anyway, you know the story. Nothing came in the mail. <laughs> and what came in the mail was this little piece of plastic jewellery. It was a bit of rubbish. And... It had my name and I opened it up and there's a little plastic key ring thing or some rubbish. It was like worth 10 cents, you know. 
And I said to everyone, I said, I don't know what this is. Someone sent me this from China. And I realised that it was the R. M. Williams. It was, <laughs> I've got this piece of rubbish. So my $40 was gone. Oh, another funny story. The bank contacted me and they said, we think you've been scammed. I said, no, no, I haven't been scammed. I've got the deal of the century. So I'm arguing with the bank, telling them how lucky I was. Oh, they must have thought, oh, another fool. We're not going to bother with him. 40, 40 bucks, let him, let him lose it. So that's the story of the fool. A fool and his money are easily parted. Is that right? Is that the quote? Andrew? The fool and his money are easily parted. Is that? Hmm? Soon parted. Yeah, soon parted. Yeah. So that's, that's the fool there. <laughs> Late at night, doesn't know what he's doing. Anyway, I don't know why I told that story. That's not, not complimentary to me, is it? Yeah, so there's going to be people in, who hear the word. This is the point. They respond to it but they get caught up in this life and everything that um, this life is promoting at us, you know, and, and we think these things are important because everyone else wants them and we want them too and we want to be like everyone else. So we end up being fruitless and that's the sad part um, to God. God wants us to bear fruit, not, not be working at um, developing our own um, fruits for this earth. You know, he wants uh, real fruit, the spiritual fruit. So they're the last group mentioned before the group that is part of the big harvest, those that are fruitful. So we need to understand that we could be a believer but be in a group where we're actually getting um, caught up in material possessions. We have to understand that. And, and I'm, not telling, I'm not saying we are there, but I think we, do, we are there from time to time in that, that uh, space. Okay, divide my inheritance. So you remember, uh, now we're going to the New Testament, you remember that the uh, fellow came to Jesus and he said, look, um, can you please um, help me with my brother? There was a legal matter that was being um, uh, argued. And can you help me with my brother? So the man, this man was in dispute with his brother over his inheritance. You probably can't read that, can you? You can? Where are the people down the back? Struggle? Yeah, it's Luke 12 anyway. But I can't make it any bigger, I'm sorry. Um, but you know the story. So he comes up and he's asking about his inheritance with Jesus. Now, under the law, um, does everyone know what the law said with the firstborn? What the firstborn gets? Everyone? Double, yeah, so he's got a double share. So firstborn gets double share and then the rest of the siblings get um, the, the, the equal division of the rest. Now, he's, he's come up. Now, he's possibly challenging this law. He's possibly challenging Deuteronomy 21, verse 17. We can only surmise that's what he's challenging. And he wants a better resolution than the, you know, him getting two-thirds and he's getting a third, which we'll assume that's the situation. So he takes the matter to Jesus and perhaps thinking that um, Jesus might say, look, to be fair, you should get half each. Now, unfortunately for him, our Lord's interest in monetary matters and legal challenges was zero. Zero interest. I have not one ounce of interest or concern with you and money and your brother. Not at all. And he says to the man, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to the people around, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So Jesus reminds everyone that seeking more than your share um, and seeking some sort of equality with others, seeking to build up your wealth, is not, um, doesn't mean anything in life, shouldn't be our mission. And then he follows with a parable straight after. And it's the parable of the rich fool. So um, it, it's because it's on greed. And Jesus delivered this parable to highlight the futility of building up your wealth. And the parable comes from um, Luke 12, verses 16 to 21. By the way, a lot of this love of money is, the book of, is found in the book of Luke, a lot of it. So the book of Luke really becomes a, a good book to discuss this subject. So the ground of a certain a rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? 
This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So really good parable um, and tells us this rich man was only focused on his wealth and building it up and protecting it and making more um, room for it and providing for his future without concerning himself with his spiritual life at all. He wasn't concerned with his character. He wasn't concerned with his relationship with God. He wanted to make merry and uh, rejoice in his wealth. And it's the parable of the eyes and the mys and the yourself and all that. We know it's a very selfish um, man in this parable. He's the sole character that was important in his life. Now, this man had lost sight of the real life that God wants us to live. And it's not a life which builds up barns. Is there anyone here with multiple barns? I don't want to offend them. Is anyone here with one barn? I'm about to build a barn. So <laughs> I know you're thinking, yeah, you laying in bed thinking about barns and all this sort of stuff. Not when I, I'm usually thinking about Aaron Williams, but sometimes I do think about my barn. But that's another story. Anyway, um, this uh, with himself, there's nothing else in the equation, just him and his wealth and his barns. What I'm trying to say is he doesn't care about anyone else. Now, I know you're going to talk about Joseph. Yeah, Joseph did the same thing, didn't he? Joseph built up all these things and, and put them in storehouses, but that wasn't about himself. That was about looking after the nation and the nations around them. So that was a, uh, a very good thing that Joseph did. So when we, we look at him and we compare this fellow, this fellow is all about himself. This was all for his own gain, uh, unlike um, uh, Joseph. So just think of this rich fool in that same way, that his life was going to be taken from him and he was going to have nothing. So all his obsession with himself and his wealth um, was going to come to a, an almighty end. Now, the Pharisees. Um, this uh, is in Luke 16, verse 13 to 15. It says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. They were sneering. They didn't like this. Hey, what are you talking about? Um, you know, money's one of our favourite things. And he says to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Jesus views loving money as being a direct opponent to our love for God. Um, money is a master. God, God is a master. And you can either serve one or the other. But you can't serve both. It's very blunt. And Jesus is calling ourselves servants. We're like servants. And we can, we can either serve God or serve um, the, the riches of this world. Now, obviously, he wants us to avoid being a slave to money. And a slave, we know, has to dedicate their whole life to their master. So he's trying to say, don't go and dedicate your life to money. It doesn't make sense. Dedicate it to God. Our devotion must be to him. Now, he knew that they were listening and they were the very audience for the subject. Because Why? Because they loved money and God knew their hearts. He knew that they put money not above him but in place of him. That's the sad thing with the Pharisees. They, they viewed money as something that was uh, it dis displaced God altogether. Now, Jesus tells us that the things we put value on are the things that God detests. Now, it might be possessions, it might be, um, you know, things that we own and, and you know, shine and, and polish and clean and we think, oh, that's such a great thing that I own. It's all the same as idolatry, isn't it? When we worship things outside of God, um, it's idolatry and upsets God. And yet we do it from time and time again. We repeat this problem and the Pharisees were the same. Now, the rich ruler. So you remember the rich ruler comes to Jesus. How am I going for time? Because I, I honestly can't see. The We're at quarter part. And what time do you, do you ask the people to sit down? <laughs> quarter past. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> He's looking at me like really awkwardly like... Um, hmm? 8.30, all right, good. So we've got this rich ruler and he goes and says... What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. And he then reels off these commandments. Don't commit adultery, murder, etc., etc. All these have I kept from my 
um, since I was a boy, he said. Now, when Jesus heard this, he says to him, you still lack one thing. Now, Jesus knew this all along. He knew that, okay, we're having this discussion, but there's one thing I know is going to hold you back. And Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. All right, so here's a, a real interaction between someone who genuinely wanted to know what he should do, but he had a lot of money. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the king, kingdom of God. Now, this, these words shocked people because they thought, hang on, are you saying rich people can't go to the kingdom? Because their view of rich people was they are the very people who are going to go to the kingdom at the very start. That's what they thought. People thought um, riches were a sign of, um, of blessing. So the rich ruler and Jesus both agreed that the commandments were to be obeyed and there was um, commandments 4 to 8 recited there. And the rich ruler claimed to be obedient in this regard, but Jesus knew that there was one thing holding him back and it was his wealth. And he told him, so Jesus said, when you sell everything, give to the poor, um, you'll be given another treasure, that's eternal life, and follow Jesus, follow, follow me. That's what he was told. And he became very sad. And we actually don't know the outcome. We don't know what he did. So I, I would think he didn't go and sell everything um, and follow through with what Jesus said. We don't, we don't know. We don't know, did he sell everything? Did he give the money to the poor? Did he see that he could have treasure in heaven? And did he follow Jesus? I don't think so. Now, I think he went back to his possessions and wealth and he found comfort in them. So he, he said to Jesus, you know what? I'll ditch eternal life. And I'll go with my wealth because that's what makes me happy. So he focused on the immediate, on what he could see, and he didn't worry about what he could have. That's what I think happened in this particular um, story. Okay, what have I got here? Now, the parable that followed. So this is a very interesting parable, isn't it? The camel going through um, the eye of the needle. So as I said, people thought rich people are blessed by God, so therefore they're, they're going to be in the kingdom. But um, that's not the case. Jesus was setting the record straight now and he says it's almost impossible for rich people to get into God's kingdom because they can't see past their riches. Their riches become their very reason for living. Their riches are their whole focus. It's the be-all and end-all of their whole life. Nothing else matters. So when we talk about the camel and the needle, I know it's one of these things that gets debated and spoken about, the Aramaic word for uh, rope is camelon, and it's almost identical to the Greek word for camel, um, which is camelon, which is how it's been translated. So perhaps Jesus was saying it's um, uh, easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. That's a possibility. Another possibility is, and I think you've heard this before, in Jerusalem there was a small gate and they called that the needle. And... Uh, it was as though, as though the camel had to go through this gate that was a, a difficult um, a gate to go through. So was he referring to that as well? Despite what we can put up here and talk about um, with the, the words themselves, the point is still the same, and that is that it's, in, it's virtually impossible for someone who's focused on their riches to enter into the kingdom because they, they unfortunately they're blindsided by them. They don't see the bigger picture, and that's the point Jesus was making. Now, Zacchaeus, here's another good story. In Luke 19, he was the chief tax collector and he was a short fellow. So we were told, and it's one of the stories in the Bible, where we're told the size of the person, his occupation, and what he did to impress Jesus. And what he did was he climbed a tree. So um, he climbed a tree because he wanted to see Jesus and there was a real um, uh, pertinence about that. There was a real desperation um, that he had to see Jesus in the crowd. Now, what happened was he wanted to see Jesus and Jesus saw him and they connected and he said, come down, um, I want to go to your house. I'm going to stay at your house. So there was a connection between um, Jesus and Zacchaeus based on what he did and I think you'll understand that to climb a tree um, as a Middle Eastern um, uh, tax collector would have been a, a big humiliating thing to do. So Jesus acknowledged that, said, I'm going to come to your house. And then what happened was Zacchaeus then confessed about 
what he'd been doing, and he says he's going to uh, give half of his wealth to the poor and repay any unfair tax amounts uh, by four, fourfold. So there was a confession of sin and he showed his desire to make things um, right. There's an example, I think, of one's love of money being reversed by Jesus. I like this particular story. Then there's the poor woman with the two mites. Um, we know that story where the rich go and put their gifts into the temple and the woman comes and puts her last two coins in there. Jesus says, just at the bottom half of that quote there, this poor widow has put in more than all of the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she of her poverty put in all she had to live on. So he compares the, the two groups, the rich coming and putting in their tithing, you know, which was a tenth of their wealth, she puts in 100% of what she had. There's a comparison um, between uh, the normal people and, and herself. And that was a beautiful thing because she was putting her trust in God. She knew that God would look after her, that God would um, help her to survive. And her actions showed a total reliance on God for all things. All right. And Ananias and Sapphira, another, and we've only got two more stories and then I'll go to the, some other quotes, but and a nice <laughs> he's looking at me like, come on, you're not going to get invited here again. Um, and a nice and Sapphira. So this is at the time when the ecclesia decided we're going to look after the poor, and what we're going to do is we're going to pull in all of our um, excesses and our properties and money that we have from those properties, and we're going to redistribute the money in the ecclesia. So this was in Jerusalem, and um, the wealth was going to go back to being an evenly distributed thing amongst the uh, people in the ecclesia. So, and it goes through the stories of, of people coming and, and giving of their um, of their property. But Ananias and Sapphira, they come and they lay down their um, money as well, but they held something back. So they, they gave the appearance of putting the property um, money there, but they held some back. They, they held some back for themselves. This was called out by Peter, and it showed how our love of money can be our ultimate demise. So... Um, uh, Ananias was was killed on the spot, and so was his wife, who came and backed up um, the same um, deceitful um, explanation about about what had happened. So it was only a voluntary donation they were make a partial one they were making, and they could have said, "Look, we've kept some of the money, but um, here's the rest of it. Um, we want to give this to um, the um, the poor." But they intimated that it was everything. That was the sad thing. Now, I do have to cover this particular one, and I think you've all been wondering when are we going to talk about Judas, because Judas was the treasurer amongst the disciples. He held the bag. And we know that when um, they went to Mary and Martha's house, that Mary used that expensive perfume and cleaned Jesus' feet, and Judas said, hang on a sec, hey, 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 hey. We, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be um, selling that perfume, uh, keeping the money, and um, using it for um, redistribution for the poor. But his objection was based on the fact that he was pilfering from the bag. And that's um, said in that particular um, uh, section uh, in John 12. So he was pulling money out of the bag already. So this is Judas. So we know his nature before um, the betrayal of Jesus. So he, um, being, he was with Jesus. So I know it's a funny story, you know, you think, if you're with Jesus, are you really going to be this bad? You know, and this is the whole thing. You know, we come... Sunday morning, and we're celebrating the death of Jesus and his sacrifice and his resurrection, and we're doing that with the emblems. But sometimes we're here and we're betraying Jesus with what we've got going in our mind. And we have to realise that this story is not to make us think, oh, what a bad disciple, but the danger that we can have in our own life of betraying um, Jesus. Now, what he did was he traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So he, he put a, a value on um, getting you know, Jesus taken away, and that value was 30 pieces, which is the same price as a slave. And um, uh, Jesus, of course, was doing what he was doing in his life to save us, and Judas was pursuing his own uh, monetary um, gain. So Jesus was betrayed with a kiss, as we know, um, by one of his disciples, and he called it at the Last Supper. He knew this was going to happen. And uh, Judas unfortunately placed money above Jesus because um, he wanted to build up his own um, financial growth instead of his spiritual growth. And later we know he regretted it, he repented, and he committed suicide. So there was a sad end there. So this probably 
is out of all the examples we would give, this would be the most highest profile um, bad uh, transaction in the Bible, a bad example of the love of money. This is the highest profile one you'll see, and that is the betrayal of Jesus. Now, of course, we what I'm going to do is, because of time, I'm going to just finish with uh, Matthew 6, which is um, what we read tonight. But there are plenty more um, uh, slides which talk about um, what we should do and how we should um, refocus on God and not focus on money. But the quote um, that I want to put up there first is, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So this is a real comment about um, your heart, where your heart is, and the laying up. Now, this laying up thing, I think this is the trap we're getting to. We're laying up and um, we've, we've got things that we collect and we got... I, I collect more than most people. I'm a bit of a hoarder. So I've got things on the back deck that shouldn't be there. Um, and the deck is supposed to be for going out and enjoying a barbecue and having people around. We can't have people around because I've got possessions there. So I've got me and my possessions and my barbecue. <laughs> So I can have a sausage and look at all my possessions. But the back deck is full of stuff, and I think it's driving everyone mad. And don't worry, these things will find a place in the barn when the barn is built. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm not making a joke. I'm just letting you know that we'll be re relocated. Um, okay. But the rest of Matthew 6 is beautiful because it talks about all these things um, in life that we observe, you know, like the, the birds. And we don't see birds going around and collecting stuff for the next day and the day after. They... They work on that day, on what they need for that day. And this is, you know, I think you know there's lots of quotes which we won't, we won't go into now, but they talk to us about that God just wants us to be content with what we have and real, make us realise that he will give us everything we need. He will look after us. He, doesn't, he loves us and he wants us to be in his kingdom and he will give us all the things we need. We don't need to go and seek those things um, ourselves as though it's all our job to do that. Um, Ephesians 1 is another great one. Verses uh, 13 and 19 goes through um, the things that we um, get from God. Uh, Luke 6, 6 verse 38, give and it will be given to you. So the idea of sharing um, what we have is what God wants us to do rather than accumulate and build up our own wealth. Matthew 7 verse 9 to 11, asking for bread um, of your uh, father, uh, would he give you a stone if you would ask for a fish, would he give you a snake? So God knows how to give us things that we need in life. And notice it's fish and bread, so it's to do with what we need, not things that we want. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 is, is beautiful as well. It, it goes um, through talking about um, uh, being a cheerful giver, so being someone that can give to others cheerfully and not, not with regret. Philippians 4, um, I'll skip over that. And then 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 to 9. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing in the world, we can take nothing out of the world. If we have food and clothing, these with these we'll be content. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. That's the, the problem we, um, we have. And for the rich in the present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to be set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides with everything, richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that which is truly life. And I love these next words. If you don't, haven't highlighted these words before, highlight them in your Bible. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. That's from the ESV. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. It's like you're saying, you know, there's rich and there's money and there's wealth and all that stuff we can have in this world but I want you to guard the deposit entrusted to you. All right, and that's the gospel. That's what you need to work with, um, and that will get you where you want to be. And the last quote, what, I, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So all the things we think are glorious in this world, they are nothing, absolutely nothing compared to what God's got in store for us. That's it. Thank you.